in Selby. <laughs> <laughs> um, this keynote broadcast is, is, as I say, going to be broadcast live, but also it's going to be available to watch online afterwards. So if, when you get home, you like to recap on anything, please go online and have a look. Um, the website address for doing that is live.youcanplay.tv. The, the broadcast itself is part of Connect Resound, which is a digital R&D fund for the arts project, uh, delivered by NIMAS, University of Hull, and You Can Play, which is researching online methods of music education and professional development. And before we go any further, I'd ask you, if you are logged on to Community House's Wi-Fi, could you get off, please? <laughs> so not to jeopardise the, uh, the broadcast. Uh, so the more bandwidth we have available for that live broadcast, the better. So thank you for that. <laughs> um, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce this afternoon Colwyn Trevathan. Uh, Colwyn is Emeritus Professor of Child Psychology and Psychobiology at the University of Edinburgh, as it probably says right up here. Uh, and is also a Vice President of the British Association for Early Childhood Education. Uh, Coleman studied at Harvard uh, and has since published extensively on brain development, infant communication and emotional health. And so I'm sure some of you will be familiar with his uh, book, Community Musicality. Uh, Colwyn was last with us uh, at NIMAS in 2012, where we actually launched this network at a fantastic event in person. So it's a real pleasure to be able to welcome him here, in here again. Thank you, Thank you Colwyn. Thank you, Colwyn. That explains why I'm using an old word. Um, um, you didn't pronounce it quite right. The, sorry. Yes. You didn't pronounce my title quite right because I'm a professor, not of psychobiology, but of psychobiology. <laughs> um, I'm a biologist, and I like that to be very clear. When I say I don't want, it's not biopsychology, it's psychobiology. It's much more biology than psychology. And the reason is that I'm an anti rational person, uh, I'm interested in natural life processes and I'm as interested in the psychology of plants as I am in the psychology of animals and uh, what I mean by that I imaginative growth I mean how they grow um, I think psychology is the study of imaginative vitality if you like now that sounds a bit crazy but a very famous physiologist Sherrington um, in, who created modern neurophysiology century said that life, all of life, he said if people try to explain evolution and, and living of organisms in terms of memory, but how can you remember something you've never done? It must be imagination. And that's a very important thing. It makes you think that no living organism can survive unless it predicts the circumstances it needs for living and moving and so on. So what I'm going to be talking about is musical aspects of babies' movement in order to, to move their own body <coughs> but also in order to share it with other people. I changed the title just now from, I mean I made this up on the train coming down <laughs> and then I, I changed it, sharing the song and dance of there and I made that bold life uh, their life with infants it's what what i want to talk about is sharing their life not our life with them uh, in other words taking the lead from the child um right well let me get on with it because i certainly won't finish um the i'm glad this is being uh copied and broadcast because i will have to go very fast over some of the text and so on I am going to make a PDF of the text and make it available so that you can read it later. Um, but this is a, a bad habit of mine, is to put all sorts of text on. But the main thing I want to do is to show you about half a dozen movies. Uh, now, this is a picture, a beautiful picture, that my students did for me for a talk I had to give in the psychology department. One of the brief occasions that the psychology department in Edinburgh has been interested in development at all in the last few years. <laughs> Um, I, a lot of what I've got to do with is the psychology of connecting people. 
and Martin Buber is very famous. He's a, a Jewish theologian who is extremely popular with Christian theologians. And his idea of I-thou or I-you relationship being fundamentally different from a relationship between a conscious person and an object, an I-it relationship, is profound. And Vittorio Galisi has this quotation. Vittorio Galisi is a top brain scientist. He's one of the mirror neuron people in Italy who've discovered that brains actually are interested in other people's movements. Um, but he's a philosopher as well, and he writes beautifully, but he, he says, he gives the fundamental relational character of human beings as described by Buber as a basic thing. Now I'm going to be talking about this. One person who's picked this up, ecology, is Vasudevi Reddy, who's a professor at Portsmouth. And she has written this book, How Infants Know Minds, which is based on the idea of second person relationships. That's I-you relationship rather than I-it. And uh, we'll come back to her. Now, uh, a very, very close friend of mine who, from whom I've learned a lot is Jonor Bjorkvold, a professor of musicology in Oslo, who has written a wonderful book called um, The Muse Within. Now, he studied children's musical culture, spontaneous musical sounds of children, preschool children and primary school children under seven, in a play, free when they're not being constrained by any teacher. And he, as a musician, he compared Oslo with St. Petersburg and Los Angeles. All the children were making music, inventing music. He called it children's musical culture. But the invention of the Oslo children was much more, much richer because in St. Petersburg it was constrained by a theory of classical music and instruction in music. And in Los Angeles it was constrained by media, artificial entertainment. So the, 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 the world can either encourage or discourage or diminish the children's enjoyment of inventing music. This is his book, and he calls The Muse Within is the need for communicating rhythmically and expressively. And he uses this picture to illustrate what he means by the power of the child. And um, this is a six-month-old baby girl illustrating what's in a baby. <laughs> it's quite a lot. Now, I just want to skip over a couple of things. I'm very interested in Scottish philosophy now, particularly you know, the, the um, Scottish Enlightenment, because they had an astonishing shift of um, philosophical understanding. Uh, Hutchison in Glasgow, giving public lectures, said humans have innate sympathy. And by that he meant that we have exactly what Martin Buber was talking about. Um, and uh, his pupils were David Hume, Adam Smith, and Thomas Reed. Now that's a pretty good professor. When the leading philosophers of Europe, that was them. Now one of them, who is not understood very well in modern society, was Adam Smith. He is not an economist. He did some economic reporting when he was traveling in Europe about what was happening with modern manufacture. That's boring. And he wasn't terribly interested in it. What he was really interested in was that he wrote a book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. He, that's what interested him. But he also wrote about art and particularly music. He loved music. And he went to concerts in uh, St. Cecilia's Hall in Edinburgh, which still is in the music department. Now, he said, this is very interesting to me, is that he described mostly instrumental music, but it applies to song, a series of agreeable sounds which have a certain relation to a common fundamental or leading note called the keynote, and a certain successional combination of notes called the song or composition. Then he said that music is telling a story. It's partly the enjoyment comes from what is going to happen and what has happened. It's linking the past with the future. And I want to emphasize the storytelling aspect of music. Now this is Adam Smith. This is a theory of moral sentiments with pictures that I've inserted. But he said, a smiling face is to everybody that sees it a cheerful object. 
A sorrowful countenance on, the, a countenance, on the other hand, is a melancholy one. This is what was meant by innate sympathy, and it's present immediately. Now, we know now, and I, I won't bother to read all this, but we have a lot of evidence now, mainly with the aid of film and video, that, there's be, that we have to change our theory of the newborn baby. It's, they're much more competent at uh, communication and, uh, than we thought. This baby is one hour old. It's resting on the father's arm, a photograph by its mother, and you look at the enormous intelligence, the total coordination of the eyes, the face, the mouth, and that one hand, which is making a gesture. That's a smart-looking human being. And there's work on fetuses now, showing that their body movements are intentional, and that, they, for example, this baby has put its thumb in its mouth and avoided poking its eye, now, I mean, there's some amazing stories coming out of the research with fetuses. First of all, they make beautifully coordinated rhythmic movements, touching their own body. If they're twins, they touch each other, and when they touch a twin, they do it more carefully. There's one movement they make to their own body, which they do more carefully, poking the eye. You know, the eyes are still sealed shut, but if they touch the eye, they do it very carefully, like you would, because it hurts if you do it here carelessly. They know about their body and they know another person's body. They know that what the difference is. Now, uh, the thing that's in, uh, in a conversation between human beings, many organs work together. They're all formed before the nervous system moves the body at all. The human eye, the humans, are the, we're the only primates with white scleras, so we can see where a person in front of us is looking, whether I mean, if you look in my eyes, that's polite. If you look at my ear, it means you're not listening. I mean, you know, the, uh, and I can tell that two or three meters away. That there's two theories. One is that humans want to make their mental processes visible, or that monkeys want to hide them, because monkeys have got brown scleras that you can't tell so well where they're looking. Okay, this is the mother-infant system I've been spending 40, 50 years studying. And I want to show you a 10-week-old lecturing her mother. This little girl is so convinced that her mother needs to know what she's got to tell her. All the mother does, and you'll see that her nose is on the far side of the screen there, she moves her head in rhythm with the child's speech, and she says, ah, da, that's about all. The baby gives her a lecture, and I hope it's going to work. Oops, sorry. Sorry. Let's see if we can get it to go. That last phrase, she's, in the last phrase, she really told the mother, and then at the end she said, did you get it? <laughs> now, we, there are three phrases in this. Each one has a, is a series of sounds that are made in the, at, as a frequency of syllables uh, in normal speech. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. On the fifth one, the baby says, da, makes a consonant, which is not meant to do at that age. Then it goes on and makes, it makes the first phrase, and then it makes the second phrase. Then it shouts at her and then says, did you get it? And then the mother imitates this sound. She says, da. She learnt from the baby. I'll play it again. She learned how to speak by imitating her baby. Okay. Now, uh, one of my colleagues has begun a physical analysis of this. And you, the green line, which indicates the loudness or the amplitude, shows how the baby's voice goes up and down. 
shouting and then comes down at the end. As it, it, the, and these are like musical or poetic phrases. There's three of them. It's not a complete story because there should be four. Now, I'm going to skip now because I want to show you films and you can look at this text later and you can uh, study it at leisure. <coughs> this baby was born three months premature in an intensive care unit in Amsterdam where they were using kangarooing, putting the babies inside the mother's clothes when they were very premature because it was found in Bigata in South America where they couldn't afford to have incubators that the premature babies inside the mother's clothes in what's called ventroventral contact, the babies did much <coughs> better than babies do in incubators. Uh, the warmth and the odour and the sounds, everything is, helps the baby. But this baby's mother had to have a, a gallbladder operation immediately after the baby was born. So she kangarooed for a little while and then she had the operation and the father took over. Now the baby, one month later, is two months premature. And I'll play the <coughs> conversation. Oh, okay. He's very proud. She smiles. She already has plump cheeks. She is under her father's t shirt and can already converse well with him. Now we have, um, I've been wor working with a um, musical acoustics expert, Stephen Malley, and he made this spectrograph. And you can see the red asterisks are the sounds made by the baby, and the black exclamation marks are the sounds made by the father. So the baby vocalizes and he replies, and he matches the pitch pretty closely. He, um, oh sorry, you see he, he matches the, the, the principal energy of his speech is pretty close to the baby's. Or they have a fast exchange, then the, he vocalizes, then the baby vocalizes and he replies, but at that point he became distracted and wasn't paying attention. After four seconds the baby called him weakly, four seconds after that she shouted at him, four seconds after that she spoke and he replied. Now the timing is absolutely fascinating. The Fast exchange is based upon andante, that is 0.7 of a second, which is the middle of the, of the range of the metronome. Now, um, it means in Italian, going along, you know, walking along. And uh, it is the basic periodicity of syllables in speech in any language. And uh, here you've got 0.75 and then exactly double, so the pulse is kept. And then it goes 65777 seven, 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 and then 0.85. And when a phonetician sees that, he said, oh, that's final lengthening. Because mm -hmm. the last syllable of a spoken phrase is longer than the others. Now, this means a two-month premature baby and a man with simple sounds are making a linguistic phrase with the classical temporal structure. And the slower part... The four-second intervals is the average length of a, a short phrase. So the baby is showing awareness, spontaneous and its own source of rhythm, of syllables, <coughs> phrases, and um, the final lengthening in the phrase. This is the how the, the middle section was blown up. Now, this is another very important phenomenon that has been found by careful observation of newborn babies. 
This is a newborn baby moving its arm in perfect synchrony with the syllables of adult speech. The person is saying to the baby, I'll give you one if it's okay. And the baby goes, I'll give you one if it's okay. And the synchrony is perfect. Now this was announced by Condon and Sander in 1974. Lou Sander is a very famous pediatrician. William <laughs> Condon was a pioneer in what's called kinesics. That's the very fine analysis of the timing of human behavior in ordinary communication. They took films of people in bars, restaurants, or bus stations, anywhere, and people talk like that with their whole body and with their head and their eyes and their speech. <coughs> And they, caught, they looked at the correlations between the various movements and they found that everything is tightly integrated and the different parts fit together like the, the, the performance of orchestral instruments in a symphony. And they called it microkinesics. The synchrony must be planned because the intervals between the events is too short for it to be reflex. It can't, the nervous system cannot coordinate things so fast if it's taking input and processing it. The idea that our brain is designed to process input is rubbish. It comes from a mechanistic theory of the brain as a, as a, as a machine system or a computer, neither of which have any imagination or intelligence. And um, so this, don't forget, I'm a psychologist, I do know what I'm talking about, I know something about brain science. The biggest nonsense is the idea that our brains are information processes that take input and turn it into output. Years ago, the man I did my doctorate with was uh, Roger Sperry, who later got a Nobel Prize after I did my... So, yes, I probably... <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sperry wrote a paper in the 1950s saying the uh, motor theory of perception. He said... All the output of the nervous system of an animal, apart from a few glandular secretions, is body movement. And he said, you understand a machine better if you study its output than if you study its input. So he said, we are movement organisms, and that's important. There's Lusander, who was the author. That paper was treated with absolute derision you know, science, psychologists said, oh, it's impossible. A newborn baby can't have a sense of time. It's not coordinated. The reflexes are not coordinated. And, you know, it doesn't have an outside awareness. How can it possibly synchronize with anybody else? Well, they do. And it's normal. It happens all the time. I mean, newborn babies do that as a spontaneous ability. Now, this is a, a fancy technology. This is, the machines are quite useful for picking up information. That's all they're good at. Now, this is uh, motion capture technology, which is uh, recording <coughs> movements. And I I'll play it to you, and then you we can discuss it. We will be walking runs through the tunnel, upstairs and downstairs and his bedroom. He can up the windy tunnel and up the lock. Along with him is in the bed as fast as a clock. We will be winking, are you coming then? The cats sit in grey thrones, stay the sleep and then. The dogs build the fun of wear and dust may give a cheek. But here's a walk of Marty that when you fall asleep. Now you're all interested in singing and storytelling. That's a very beautiful song sung by a great Scottish singer. I showed this film to the professor of music in Edinburgh and I said, are the dots and the song related or is it an illusion? He said, no, it's the same thing. He said, they're, they're both human movement. And um, that means that the thing that's important is not what's moving or how it's being perceived, it's the movement itself is something that is identifiable. This is the left and right arm of a newborn baby that is hungry. It's on its mother's uh, lap. The red dot is the left arm, which you can see near the camera. And it's got a, a little ball on it, which is the emitter, which the apparatus is recording. The green dot was on the right arm. 
and the baby is hungry. Oh dear. Um, I think I'll try and find that if you can. It'll only take a minute, I think. I think I, if I find it quickly, it'll be good. Uh, if I don't find it quickly, no, I'm go I'll, it'll take me too long. But I can. I'll just play it again uh, from the other. Um, I'll play it from here, and the baby is threshing around like this, and then the mother strokes it on the cheek, and the arm goes down, and it gets quiet. And then it's fussing a bit, and the, the, finally the, the le left arm is making big movements like this, and the right one goes like that. That's when the little boy won't go to sleep. Now, I'll just play it once more, and you can, you can sense the mood changing in the baby. It's now it's threshing about. See how the phrase together. This is amazing, this bit. This is where the mother strokes the cheeks. And the baby's. It's got much quieter, you see, when the mother. But the baby is fretting. All right. I'm sorry about that. Now, Sheena Wellington is sort of singing that. Now, there's the, po there's the poem. The, uh, I want to show these poems because, as you almost certainly know, baby songs ha are four line stanzas. And that's true of any, in any culture. And they tend to have rhyming vowels at the end of the lines. Town and gown and lock and clock and in, hen and sheep and asleep. They don't have to be the neighbouring lines, they can be separate lines. And this, you can actually get hold of this video, video and the discussion around it by getting this DVD from Susan Zedek. Now, infants share musical proto-conversations and then they develop, an, a, they develop an appetite to rituals of play, such as Clapper Clapper Handies, other kinds of action songs. And they show pride. Now one of the things that I want to emphasize throughout is the whole baby being expressive. And it's fascinating how gestures of the hands can be so expressive. This is the daughter of a professor, a man who is now professor of music in Edinburgh, Ray MacDonald. And uh, he's a saxophone player and a very good musician. He was thrilled when his six-hour-old baby looked like a conductor. <laughs> but if you really want to penetrate the spirit of that child, this is a French chef who's made a perfect sauce. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing that's important is the synchrony of the two hands, the tongue, the eyes, yeah, like that. This is a half hour old baby in India. There they don't have any fancy postnatal care. They dump the baby on a couch, on a pillow. And the, a visitor came and started playing with the baby, waving a ball around. And this half hour old baby tracked the ball with its eyes, its nose, its mouth, both hands and one foot. Because it was playing a game. Because there was a teasing of the baby. Now, hand gesture, gestures are very important. I'll show you a story. This is an app, uh, a setup we put in the, uh, one of my colleagues has put in the neonatal unit in Edinburgh, where he can record those uh, motion capture, for example, of the one you've just seen. This baby has motion capture and it's a video. Um, but what, what I want you to, there's, you see it's got things attached to it to measure eye movements and all sorts of things. It doesn't disturb the baby. He's one month premature. And his mother and he have a conversation. 
and watch his hands and watch his hands with her ah. voice. See, they often synchronize. See the hand? Good afternoon, Wendy. Oh, which is He kicked her in the stomach. She's leaning over him. Now, you see, she's talking about his movements and she's fitting her speech into his movements. Now, it has the classical structure of a narrative. Introduction, development, climax and resolution. The introduction, she's inviting him. She says, are you woken up, mister? Good afternoon. Good afternoon, we been. How are you doing? And all of the, the, the pitch of her voice goes up, questioning. Then he smiles and she's, oh, look at that big <coughs> smile. And her voice goes down a little bit. The box is where she turns and looks at the equipment and says, oh, that's all right, meaning that the heartbeat and breathing is looking fine. Then she says, look at that big smile. Then he makes these huge movements and she glides over an octave like a singer. She, she kisses him and goes, oh, like that. And then that she says in a deeper voice, oh, you're kicking your mum, which is ironic. Then there's a coda because she says, are you kicking me? And then he does another one of these big movements. And the pattern is like that. There's the introduction, development, climax and resolution. Now, with a coda. Now, <coughs> this curve is in fact the curve of hunger before, during and after a meal. It's a physiological curve. You, when you're thinking about eating, when you're eating, when you're really enjoying and finishing it, and when you've finished. And this is something physiological inside us, which describes a drama, if you like, or a cycle of energy, or a circle of energy. And that's the foundation for the structure of narrative cycles. And baby action songs and nursery rhymes are a rich resource for studying that. And we've done a lot of work with them in different languages. <clears throat> I'll show you another film. This is a, it's to emphasize the transmodal movement meaning, the intermodal meaning of human, a narrative story in human body movement. This baby is blind and the mother is singing a Swedish baby song. She's singing it very, very slowly while she is feeding the baby. And then what you have to do is to watch the baby's left hand. Now this is the end of the second verse. Watch the left hand. Well, um, I showed that to the professor, Nigel Osborne, who was the professor of music then, and he said, yes, the baby is conducting like a professional. I'm doing all the correct movements, going up for a pitch and making a phrase and then closing like that. And he said, with some anticipation. So we measured it very carefully. And when we measured the index finger movement and compared it with the pitch of the mother's voice, where there are those red um, uh, bars, third of a second ahead of the mother's voice. So the baby is leading the mother in, like a real conductor. The baby knows the song, the sound of the song into its body, intuitively. Nobody knew the baby was doing this until we saw the, the people saw the film afterwards. The baby was not trained to do this at all. 
where the red arrows are, the baby is completely synchronous. Now, we've done research on jazz duets. One of my students is a very good jazz musician. And he compared jazz duets with mother baby communication. And they have the same temporal patterns. And jazz musicians doing in, improvising in a duet share time. Sometimes one is leading and the other is leading, or the other is leading, and sometimes at, at very definite places they synchronize. And this is the, the pattern of shared intentionality, which is the foundation for the joint activities. This Swedish baby song has rhyming lines. Swedish has, I think, 14 vowels, so about twice as many as English. In this song, eight different vowels are rhymed in all the different verses. There are four verses. In each verse, two vowels rhyme, so there are eight different vowels. This baby is getting a feast of Swedish vowels. And these are the sounds that babies of that age, four or five months, imit babies at first language sounds that they imitate. This is some work done in Greece. Babies responding to Theodorakis music by moving their bodies. The one on the, um, this one here, is a girl and she's wiggling her bottom in relation to the music. The little boy is pounding the table and he shows four stages of involvement. Surprise when the music comes on, interest, joy, and then he starts hitting the floor. And it's very interesting how the relationship is made as a story. Now, uh, this is probably the main point I want to make for you. You all know this. You see, I know that I'm not telling you things you don't know. I, this is a lecture for, to teach psychologists, not to teach people who know about singing. Um, now, one thing, in the, uh, an amazing number of things happened simultaneously around the end of the 60s or the first uh, decade, the uh, first days, first weeks of the 70s. Uh, and there were three independent explorers working very close to each other without meeting each other in the east coast of the United States in 1969, 1970. And their stuff was published in 74, 75. And one of them, the mo I think an absolutely brilliant pioneer, was Mary Catherine Bateson. She was a <coughs> very interesting human being because she was the daughter of Gregory Bateson and Margaret Mead the two most famous anthropologists in the world. And she had a tough childhood. She's a lovely um, interview between her and her father, which was published, and it's called So What? Her father is, tells, him, tells her his latest theory, and she just says, so what? And then he tells another theory, and then she says, so what? And the whole conversation, that's the kind of relationship she had with her clever father, Professor. Um, but she became an anthropologist and a linguist, and she worked in, in uh, she was a specialist in Persian. And she was about to have a baby, and she was invited by, uh, uh, to, um, she was at Amherst University doing, doing res uh, research, and she was invited to go to MIT by um, uh, Margaret Bulloa, who was working in the linguistics lab, and she, Margaret Bulloa showed Mary Catherine Bates in a film of a nine-week-old baby. And Mary Catherine Bates wrote this about it. it was seven, she studied a number of films. As an expectant mother, she was very sensitive. And she said she saw incredibly precise interactions between the, children, the babies and their mothers. As a linguist, she was fascinated with the precision. And she called it delighted ritualized courtesy and more or less sustained attention and mutual gaze. And she noticed that the baby was often leading. She said the development of the capacity for participation in complex sequence behavior must lay the groundwork for participation in games and for the development of playful patterns of imitation. And so the study of such performances can shed light on a variety of types of learning, including language acquisition. As a linguist, she saw this as the motor coordination as the foundation for syntax, linguistic syntax. And that has been abundantly demonstrated since. We started work a few miles away. I've never met Mary Catherine Bateson, but we were only about three miles away at Harvard. 
and we started work. The other third, the third person was in New York, and that was Daniel Stern, working as a child psychiatrist, looking at mother-baby communication. All three of us were absolutely amazed at the baby's cleverness, because no one had actually perceived it from the baby's point of view before. Now, the first thing we saw is illustrated in this, that we set up a laboratory where the baby was very comfortable in up high level with the mother, and they were left alone to just have a chat. Now, what we noticed is shown here, the baby's imitating the mother, not the other way around. I'm sorry, big got there. The mother is imitating the baby, not the other way around. Babies don't need to learn anything by imitating. They like to be imitated because it confirms that you have understood what they're saying. I'm going to show you, yeah, all right, this is the little girl, Laura, on her mother's lap, who wrote Communicative Musicality, the book. Now, the book has 27 chapters. They were all anticipated by Laura. Laura um, came to Edinburgh University when she was six weeks old, and she sat in front of her mother, and they had a conversation. I'll play the conversation. Tell me some more then. I think you will agree this sounds like a story that has finished. Stephen Malick did a very, I'll play it for you, I can play the old, this is a very old film. The sound is good but the film is terrible. Um, but you can see it. Well, just to show you, it involves head movements and, and that, and she's orchestrating her sounds to fit the baby. There's another very important point, which I haven't got time to go into at all. Um, we saw a, baby, a blind baby conducting with the left hand. The left hand is very sensitive to affective um, context, if emotional context. The right ha hand is always making stories and signals. This baby is moving her right hand when she's telling her mother something. That's a rule. This means that a baby uh, just a few weeks old is already asymmetric with the language, so-called language hemisphere, the left one, moving the right hand more. So babies make declarations like that and they, like we do when we're talking, and th this is true for babies that are going to become left-handers as well, which is strange. Um, anyway, this is Stephen Malick's analysis of the pitch of that. And notice the language. If a linguist looks at these utterances, they would say that the first group of utterances are invocations or invitations. The second ones include some kind of celebration. The climax, the mother is actually starting to use non-speech sounds. She goes ch 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 and the baby vocalizes with her. And at the end, she's doing no words at all. She says, agu, agu and that's the resolution. Look at the shape of the curve. It's a wave of energy which goes down. The, it, it occupies an octave above middle C. Now, this is what Stephen Malick said, but you can read it in the book. He was astonished that he was tapping the foot to human speech. He couldn't believe it, and then he realized, he said, a few weeks later the words communicative musicality came into my mind, as a way of describing what I had heard. Now, he analyzed it, and these, just to speed th the process, I want to tell you what you're seeing. The red bars go through sh consonants, which can be very precisely timed. They mark bar structure, as in music. The one and a half second bars. Inside, there are rhythmic patterns, which amount to four notes to the bar, most of the time. Notes are present. 
But I just want to show you this. This, see, one and a half seconds. The mother says, "Come on, then." That uh, uh, again, that's clever, you know. And she, the, this is uh, k, g, th, very short sounds, which can be precisely timed. Here, there's a bar left vacant, and the baby fills it perfectly, spontaneously. Then the mother goes on with a higher pitch because she's excited, and then. They, she gets very rhythmic, and here's a rhythmic phrase where the baby makes a sound synchronous with the mother's last note. Then the mother makes this glide middle C, oh, which is an acceptance. And then she does clicking of her tongue, and the baby does these sounds with her. Now, we're only talking about seconds, so I think I can play these. <laughs> You can begin to feel there's a real proper musical pulse for it, um, uh, phrasing for it. See, the, this is the precision, just like jazz improvisation. Okay, now introduction, development, climax, and resolution is a good description for that. And this, uh, Stephen Malik identified these parameters pulse quality and narrative. We can go into them, but he said that they dis uh, he particularly emphasized narrative, allowing two persons to share a sense of purpose in passing time. Now, I'm going to cheat and just there's the family. Um, Laura is now, this is 30 years later, no, 30 years later. She had a baby, by the way, and, they, and the father sent me of her talking to her baby, and she said, ah, goo, and I sent a message back, you've learnt nothing, because that's, <laughs> that's what you said to your mother 30 years ago. And um, there's the book, and I wa just want to show, well, there's some stuff on mothers with, with psychiatric illness. Um, depressed mothers vocalize l below middle C. And they, when they get healthy, they go back up the octave above middle C. And this is a mother with, with bipolar psychosis. <coughs> and she repeats the same structure over and over again, you know, with no respect. Now, I ju all I want to do now is to show, this is a very short, very funny movie. I'm, I'm getting away with it, I think. <laughs> See, this is what human beings are like. We're born to learn silly rituals. And I tell my students that if they go to university and work hard for four years, they get a degree, that's the equivalent to a kiss. <laughs> They've learnt the ritual. Now, I just want to show, this is, these are the patterns of familiar baby songs with rhyming vowels, iambic um, pulse, and it goes round and round the guard, then round the teddy bear. And then it goes one step, two step, it's getting menacing, and particularly under there with accelerando. Now, this is what it's like, and the baby's vocalised on the last vowel. I want to do round and round the garden to make one point. That's round and round the garden, and the mother looks as though she's enjoying it more than the baby. <laughs> this is clapper clapper handies. Baby is clapping with its hands on the outside of hers. Um, Emma, at six months, was a real expert at clapping hands. She's left-handed. She's now 20 years old. She is a very bright left-handed female. Left-handed females are often earlier at speaking. 
than right-handed ones. How many of you females are left-handed? No, but my daughter is and she is. Yeah. <laughs> well, you are in music because that's another correlation. Left-handed females are often good at, at, at singing and music. Now, the, no, these things never apply to males, by the way. Males are different. Sometimes they, come, sometimes they turn out to be architects or mathematicians or something, but they, they're not precocious in speech like some left-handed female. Sorry. Now, uh, the final point I want to make, make is a moral one. There's a huge amount of pride it, for a former five-month-old or a six-month-old who knows how to do something that other people appreciate. They show this expression. And the father is looking proud too. By the way, on the shelf you can see he's proud of playing darts in the pub. <laughs> now that expression on the baby is the same as the queen on her jubilee. <laughs> it's pride. And babies showing pride have an intense regard and a big smile. This is Emma, who's very brave in front of a stranger who's trying to be nice, but like all strangers, is stupid. He comes up to her and he speaks to her, and then she shows him clap handies like that. And he says, aren't you going to say something to me? And she says, are you crazy? I just showed you what I'm famous for. <laughs> and then she wouldn't look at him and does it to herself. Now, this is shame. Babies of the same age, they show tremendous shame in front of strangers. All these babies are in front of strangers, except the last one. There she is in front of a stranger. Immediately afterwards, she was with her mother and she was furious with her mother for leaving her with a stranger. This is what they're like, 10 months olds are like with strangers. They're really sad and that's sadness. Now this is the moral aspect, you know, you're either connected or you're not. And I don't know who the children are ashamed of, themselves or the, ch uh, or the other person. That's the trouble with these things. All right, well, I will leave all the rest, which is on the physiology of movement. The point is we have to be rhythmic to move at all, and we use the rhythms of our expression of the whole range of our body movements to communicate with other people. The voice is special because the voice comes from within the body and can reveal a huge amount about the internal state of peace or pleasure or displeasure. So it, it, it has a very special role. But don't think when you're singing that you're not also dancing or, you know, conducting or whatever. Lots of other things. Anyway, I'll stop now. Uh, I'm going to make a PDF of this so you can study what I didn't speak about. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, see? <laughs> I'm very sorry. Thank you so much, Colwyn. Absolutely fascinating stuff. And I think we could all probably stay here most of the afternoon and <laughs> keep watching videos. And, but it'd be great if, if we could see your slides afterwards because it'd be yeah, lovely yeah, more I'll time to be able to digest those in, in detail. Um, we are running a little bit behind, but I would like to have a chance for questions if anyone's got anything burning that they would like to ask Colwyn. Yeah. Beth. I guess one of the things I studied on my MA was what happens with language physically affecting the body. And I'm wondering if you know of anybody that's doing that kind of, the way uh, a word will um, impact on the muscles of the body internally. Well, uh, obviously, I mean, a word is not just text. No. We're trapped in text because we're literate. But when you, you I know you're not talking about text, you're talking no, about spoken word. Because we gather, we gather language through our senses, don't yes, we? Yes, yes, yes. Well, Sensibly. later on in this, I talk about how text is sort of plastered onto an already very deep knowledge yes. of human communication. And um, the text has a very pernicious effect, yes. and it's getting worse with the electronic media. We, people who belong to literate cultures have poorer memories mm -hmm. than people who are preliterate, yes. meaning that they don't, we don't recall vividly the experiences of... of in the world and with other people um, and because we've, we've got too much clutter in the, in the formulated information of, uh, of text information. Now, I mean, I love looking at the etymological dictionary because the etymological dictionary goes back to metaphor and the meanings of the words are vital. I mean, they're in the body. 
But I want to just tell you, I've just heard of a research project. Uh, I haven't reviewed the paper yet, but I've got sent an abstract studying lip movements of fetuses, correlating them with the sounds of speech that the fetus is hearing. Yeah. So it's pretty yeah. deep. Yeah, and consonants and yeah. the way they affect, the, the way they impact on us. Yes. Or bird doors and a dirt, you know. I don't, <laughs> I'm never fond of the word impact. It's used a lot. Yeah. I think, I don't know what is the best way to put it dramatically, because they enter into us is one way of saying it. it, it it's very different from impact. It's not, you're not hit by these things. They involve you and you I have to... I remember being feel, after I've meditated for a long time during my MA, that they did hit, that some words and some consonants do feel... Yes. Well, obviously, there is some very good work. Actually, in Edinburgh, the w years ago, the phoneticians were doing work on swear words. Yeah. And, you know, the, the actual physical Im yeah. impact there. In a swear word, impact is not a bad word. But, but from other kinds of uh, transmission of sensation, it, then it's not a good word. The, there was some work, yes, yeah, okay. some years ago. Um, anyway, um, yes, I think um, I haven't got around to showing you the uh, temporal. This is another thing. I w I'm very interested now in looking at the times of the body and the body of movement. And we've got a lot of evidence that, that these time bands, which are important in speech, are shared with newborn babies. They've got them all. But what I want to uh, concentrate on is the fact that the longer ones, the, three, the f length of a phrase, which is three to, second, three to six seconds, and the length of a verse, a stanza. The, these, uh, all these three and longer ones, longer stories made up of stanzas, these are all in baby songs and in any language. Now I'm calling these visceral times because they're inside the body. They're, they're vital times and these ones are more somatic. They're to do with the how you move your body in relation to the world, looking at things or touching them and so on. So there's the use of the body as an instrument to engage with the world, and then there's the inner, inner processes, which, I mean, it's very interesting to think that the most abstract function of language, I mean, the most creative function of language to tell a story is coming from your gut. <laughs> you know, from, from breathing cycles and heartbeat cycles, which are regulated by the autonomic nervous system. Now, it's very interesting that, you know, we're deep inside our vitality when we share a story. And that's true of a baby song when they're six months, you're six months old. And mothers know that babies are deeply